So in John chapter 8, there's a story, and it's not, I, I, I hesitate calling it a story because a lot of times we say story, it's something that could be make believe, but this is an account of something that really happened. So Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus who was caught in adultery. And many, many years ago, when I was in Bible school, I felt like the Lord gave me a, a skit. It was like a monologue where of all the different parts. And God showed me a lot of things about this story where this woman is presented to Jesus caught in adultery. And I was shown some things from the Lord about the perception of those involved and the mindset of those involved and how God really saw that situation. This woman is brought in adultery thrown at Jesus' feet. We caught her in the very act. And there's things in this story that I think are very important for us to see about the character of God and, and the mind of God. And Jesus, how He treats not only her, but the, the men that were there. There's many things in this account that speak to us and that I'd like us to dwell upon, notwithstanding that we should be like Jesus in this instance, but that there's some things that He'd really like to, to show us. One thing about this story in John 8, when this woman is brought before him, the woman that's caught in adultery, I always marvel at the mercy of God Amen. in the midst of his omniscience, that he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to be said. He saw it from the foundation of the world, but he sees it and there's still compassion and he dodges he seemingly dodges the concerns and the questions of fleshly man to redirect the entire thing to a spiritual application and what's Amen. deeper and what's at the root. So many times in the scripture, people come and they present a question or a situation to Jesus. Jesus this or Jesus that or Jesus look what happened. And it's almost like Jesus doesn't even see what they said or what they asked. He just kind of sidesteps right around it and starts talking about a different issue, something that's deeper at the heart of what they're really bringing to him. And that's really what happens in this story. They bring a woman caught in adultery to him. And instead of really just addressing the woman that's caught in adultery and addressing what's brought before him, he kind of sidesteps it and begins to talk about things that they didn't want him to talk about or didn't think he was going to talk about. And that's so applicable to our lives. That's what he does. The Godhead, he's so masterful in his interweaving that sometimes it's almost like he dismisses the question that's brought to him. And he goes so much deeper. And he goes so much farther. And he goes beyond. So let's read it together in John chapter 8, verse 1. So it says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, He came again into the temple, and all the people came to Him, and He sat down and He taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to Him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to Him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, He commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he didn't hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up, and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience went one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And Jesus spoke again, and then he continues to teach. So he tells her, Rise and sin no more. Now, this is where I want to start. Look very closely on how the entire interaction begins. But to see how it really begins, we go to John 4 and verse, or John 7 and verse 53. So one verse prior, 7:53, and it says, And everyone 
went to their own house. But in one it says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, it is significant that all of this started with men going their own way and our Lord going to pray. He was accustomed to going alone and praying. Before this situation, before this, this conflict happens, we find Him praying. He's alone, praying. And then He comes early in the morning and begins to, to teach. Now, in the prior chapter, we didn't read it, but in the prior chapter, they're calling Jesus a deceiver. They're trying to kill Him. They're finding a reason to kill Him. And that's what they're scheming to do. And the Bible says that it wasn't his time yet, so it didn't happen. And after all that, he goes to pray. And in my Bible, I wrote a note. It said, and to me, it was like the Holy Ghost was speaking. It says, everybody went to their own house. They went to comfort. They went to ease. They went to what was familiar. They went to what they knew. But not so with Jesus. He went to pray. Where it might not have been very comfortable. And it involved discipline. And it involved focus. And he goes, and many commentaries believe that he probably prayed all night. It doesn't say that, so we can only speculate. But it says he went to the Mount of Olives. And that was his, his habit of going there to pray. And so when he comes on scene again in this situation, he's coming right down from where he was in the presence of God praying. And that's how it all starts. And that's not only significant to the story, it's significant to our lives. In prayer, it's times of prayer, it's times where we're constantly, that's why it says in, in Thessalonians that we pray without ceasing. You pray without ceasing because when these situations come and they arise with us, we don't know they're coming. But to be prayed up and to have that communion and that lifeline with the Lord, it says that it will be given to us what to say in that time. We don't have to premeditate it and think about it. But if you're in that place with the Lord, then we go through those situations. Not only is our Savior at the Mount of Olives, but He's there to pray. The concept is backed up over and over in the Word. Now you're saying it doesn't say that He went to pray. It says, but Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. Hold on. Hold on to that thought. You're saying it doesn't say he went to pray. Mark 6, 46, it says, When he sent them away, he departed to a mountain and he prayed. Luke 6, 12 said, And it came to pass in those days, he went to a mountain and he prayed. And he continued all night in prayer. And Luke 11, 1, it says, It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place alone, his disciples came to him and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And in Luke twenty two thirty nine, 39, it says, It came to pass he was praying and he went as he was in a habit of doing to go to the Mount of Olives to pray. So I think we can pretty confidently say he was praying. Amen. He was there praying. Because how do we interpret Scripture? By other Scripture. Right. That's how you interpret Scripture. By other Scriptures. He was praying. He was there praying. So we find Jesus first in a place of communion, first in a place of prayer, and secondly, he arises what? At 10 o'clock... He arises after he hit his snooze three, four times. He arrived when his kids started tugging at the hem of his garment. He arose early to go teach. That, that kind of cuts me a little bit when I read that one. Because like you and I, he had this body. He got tired. It says he slept. He bled. He cried. There was hardship. He got weary. Y'all, he got weary at times. He has disciples come to him and say, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he turns and says, I saw the devil fall like lightning from heaven. There was times where he got weary. There was weariness at times. But he got up early, early to go teach. And I do believe he probably prayed all night. He was there praying all night and gets up what? Early. And that's not just a, a spiritual lesson. That's a practical lesson for me and for you. That there's discipline involved. There's sacrifice involved. How many of you know to really walk with God, to really walk with Him, there's sacrifice. Yeah. There will be a little bit of suffering. You will not be comfortable. Yeah. It's a fine, it's a knife edge 
to walk with him at times. And it goes against. That's why Jesus had, I'm going off on tangents now, but, I'm, but it's applicable. So that's why Jesus had us fast, right? To deny the flesh and learn denial. To learn to suffer a little bit. To learn to sacrifice. No, you don't need that. You need to go here. And that's one of the things that God is speaking to us in that scripture. That he prays, then he got and he put aside his comfort and he went to a mountain. While people's heads are on a pillow, his head is on a rock and he's up in the mountains praying. And then he gets up early to teach the people. Not only is he weary and he has a body just like us at that time. He's Godhead. He's fully God, but he's wrapped in this flesh. Touched with the same things. It said he was a high priest that was touched with our infirmities so that he might have compassion on us in the time of need. That he learned obedience by the things he suffered. He had this kind of body, but yet he shows us it's possible to be disciplined, to rise up early. And not only that, but his heart was one. He had compassion on those people. They needed to hear. They needed to learn. They needed a teacher and a shepherd after their soul that really loved them. So... I've harped on that enough. So he comes and he's teaching the people. And he sits down and he teaches them. And there's discipline. And you know what? There's always discipline before disciples. So he's there teaching them. And he shows us what discipline looks like. And he shows us what compassion looks like. And he shows us what the passion of God's heart is to teach the people early in the morning. So the story goes on. And the scribes and the Pharisees come to him. So look at verse 3 in chapter 8, verse 3 of John. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So <laughs> I see them like this. They're like this. What do you say? Yeah. We got him. We got him. This is fleshly wisdom. This is men. They've been pondering this and planning this since the inception. Oh, we got him now. This question's a rough one. And you know what? When you study this out, it's an awesome question. According to man's wisdom, this is a great question. And it would stump any one of us. But we'll see how the Lord handles it. Because... Really, when you break this down, let's break down this question and find out why it was a good way. It was a good way to present this to him. But what, what else is powerful is in the previous chapter, they're calling him a deceiver and trying to kill him. And what do they call him when they bring the woman to him when they think they have the upper hand? Hey, master, teacher, you hypocrites. They were just trying to kill him in the previous chapter. But now when they think, oh, we got him. Now he's master and teacher. You know, and as a side note, how many people do that with you and I? You know, they'll call you names. They'll call you every dirty name. But then when they think they got you backed against the wall, hey, Christian, aren't you a Christian? Hey, man of God. I've experienced that countless times in my life. When they think they got you, caught you in something. It's no longer a dirty name. Then they just mock you. So here they are patronizing him. And they come and they bring him this woman. And they say this, tempting him. They, may, they might have a reason to accuse him. To accuse him. Now think about this question. Listen closely. This is something God showed me many years ago. About how they presented this to him. According to man's wisdom. It's a great question. A great question because this is one of those questions you can't win any way you try to answer you'll be wrong if Jesus was to say you're right that is the law who am I to go against the law she is to be stoned then what's to say of his compassion his mercy his testimony his forgiveness I've come to seek and save the lost I've come to put right, I've come to fulfill the law. Where's all that testimony of Jesus saying, rise, be healed. God loves you. Rise, sin no more. Where's that whole testimony? It's shocked. If he says, yep, that's what the law says. Stone away. Here, here's a rock. Then that whole character of Christ that he's shown for those years comes to question. But now take it from the other side. If he says, where's your compassion? 
Where's your mercy? You heartless, merciless hypocrites, leave her alone. Forgive her. I thought you were the son of God. What do you mean? This is the law of God, and you say we're not supposed to obey the dictates of Almighty God who gave to Moses? That's, your, that's what you're telling us? You can't win this question. If he's to answer, one, it will disrepute his character and everything he came to do and to die and show mercy. Two, it's just the law. Beat him over the head. And then he doesn't, he's not living out the fulfillment of what God has. So how does Jesus answer this question? How does he answer this question that would stump every one of us? He doesn't. He doesn't. You see, they thought this through. They thought this through. This was a cloak and dagger operation. This wasn't spur of the moment. You know why I think that? They brought him a woman caught in adultery. Listen, in the very act. That's not an act you do in front of people. That's something done in the cloak of darkness. Behind closed doors, with the shades drawn, nobody knows. It's secret sin. But they catch her in the very act. This was a scheme. This was a scheme. We couldn't kill him. It wasn't his time. So now we'll cast him into disrepute. We'll, we'll show that he's coming against the law of God. Or we'll show that his character is blemished and fallible. And so we keep reading. And this is what God showed me. He sits there. And he's silent. And in that time of silence, I felt like God spoke to me and said, Who do you think he was praying for all night the night before? Who do you think I was praying for? You didn't know? You didn't think I knew what was coming? I knew what was coming. I knew these men with their wicked black hearts were going to come and bring an overt sin to hide their covert sin. I knew this was coming. And I spent the night in prayer. Why? Because it says in this book, it says, He ever liveth to make intercession for us. He was making prayer. He was interceding for them. He knew. Praying for that woman, praying for what's to come, knowing I'm going to die, praying for the men whose hearts are so deceived. He was prepared in prayer. And he comes and there they are and they think they have him backed into a corner and that he can't possibly navigate this maze, this labyrinth of words that we've laid before him. There's points and edges on every side. Go ahead and try to answer this without getting cut. It says that Jesus... Stooped down with his finger and he wrote on the ground as though he didn't hear them. They present words to the king that created words and that formed the tongue in their mouth, thinking that they can they can be victorious in verbal judo over the king of all creation. Really? So now there's speculation. There's lots of commentaries that speculate on what Jesus wrote in the dirt and why he wrote in the dirt. Some say that he was writing the names of the men. Some say he was writing the sins of the men. I don't really think it's important. I really don't. According to the scripture, I don't think the focus is on the fact that he wrote in the dirt. I think the importance is the silence. And that's what the title of this sermon is. The silence that roars... The silence that roars. So he's silent. He answers them not a word. So there they are, standing, ready to kill this woman with stones, maybe. And they're like... And Jesus acts like he doesn't even hear them. And there's a crowd probably gathering by this time. And people are watching to see what's going to be done. And you could hear a pin drop. And he answers them not a word. They're all worked up into a lather. It's a hot mess. They're ready to go. And Jesus doesn't say anything. And he pretends like they're not even there. And it says in the scripture that then those that heard it, it says before it says that he, that um, they continue to ask him. 
So they ask him the question in, in verse 5, what do you say, testing him. They might have something accusing him. It says that he stooped down, he wrote in the dirt as if he didn't hear them. And then in 7 it says, so they continued asking him because he's ignoring them. So when it's totally silent, they ask again. So, so what, what's the answer? <laughs> Tell us, you know. That's okay. Now, this is what God showed me. And I believe this is the Lord. Listen closely. The importance was not drawing in the dirt. The importance was the silence. And this is powerful. It may not be powerful to you, to me. It really blessed me. and It was powerful to me. That this silence was a precursor. He was showing them what he was going to do for them. Listen. He was despised and rejected of men. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But his, he was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. And we've turned every one to our own way. And the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb or silent. He opened not his mouth. And I believe that's what was happening. Jesus sits there, says nothing, and roars from that silence. This is exactly what I'm going to do for you. I'm not going to say a word when I die for you. I'm in preparation to give my life for you. And it'll be just like this. And I'll do it for a love for you. I'll do it because it's the plan of God. I'll do it because it's the will of God. I'll do it because it's the fulfillment of all prophecy. And the only way to sanctify you and rectify this broken relationship. And I'll do it like this in total silence. And I'll go and I'll die for you. What an amazing thought that he knew for such a one, he's going to die. They're ready to kill her. And he's thinking, I'm going to die for you and you're going to kill me for you. I'm not only going to die for this woman, I'm going to die for you. And no one took Jesus' life. He gave it willingly. You don't take from him his life. He gave it as an offering. He said, no power is given unto you unless it's given to you from, my kingdom, from, from God's kingdom. He said, don't you know even now I can call 12 legions of angels and wipe you all out. No one takes my life. I give it willingly. For I can see the glory in the cross. So, like a precursor to the cross, that silence says, I'll die for you. You're ready to destroy this woman for her sins but I'm going to be destroyed for years. We are so quick to point our finger at others. Oh, look at your overt sin. Look at how terrible you are. You smoke, drink, and chew and go with girls that do. And look at me. <laughs> I'm angelic on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones on the inside. I have pointed my finger so many times in my life, in my heart, judging someone. And I just hear something from the Lord. Wretch. <laughs> Look at them. Wretch. What are you talking about? It's the same blood. It's the same blood. It's the same process of sanctification. You can point the finger all you want. But when you have a two by four sticking out of your eye, you can't get through any doorway. You better take it out before you start pointing out the speck in others. That's right. Jesus was perfect. And there was two by four sticking out of all these men's eyes. I'm, I'm surprised they could stand in a group, you know, without bashing each other in the head. And they're pointing at this woman. 
And he, what does Jesus say? He says, He that is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. You who is speckless, you who has nothing in your eye, he who is perfect, you go ahead and pick up a rock and you go first. What an exposure of their hearts. And that's why I said that in the beginning. Jesus doesn't just take what comes at face value. Jesus, I need help with this. Let me just give you a practical example. Let me just give you a practical example. I'll apply it to my, I'll pick on myself. So I need a house to move to Craig. Oh God, I need a house. Oh Wyatt, you need faith. It's that simple. God could say, could talk about the house, but it's not about a house, is it? It's not. It's about your heart. It's about your relationship with Him. It's about your faith. How much do you love me? Do you trust me? Do you really trust me? We can ask for one thing, but Jesus Christ will always take it to the heart of the matter. And that's exactly what He did with these men. This woman was caught in adultery. This is what He did. He stepped right around it. He said, go ahead and throw the stone. You that's perfect has no sin. But that's not the question we asked. We didn't ask you that. No, but that's what's really deep down at the heart of the matter. And that's really what God is speaking. And you know what? There's something that I think when I hear God say, He that is without sin, let him throw the first stone at her. And this is the thing that came to my mind. Aw, oh, snap. Aw, <laughs> yeah. oh, snap. You got had. You backed the king of glory into a corner and you think you have him. The prince of the morning, you back him into a corner. The one that formed you in your mother's womb and that decided what your personality would be like and how you'd look and what color your hair would be. Oh, well, we got him back into a corner. We got him now. No. And you know what? He didn't even do it. He didn't say this to them to one-up them. And he didn't say this to them to make them look like fools. And he didn't say it to them to show his prowess. He said it to them because it was in the heart of Almighty God to get to the heart of the matter, to bring about change, to bring about life, to show them there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And I'm, I, see, I see the heart. I don't look at the outside appearance. I see the heart. I don't look at this woman on her outside of what she did. I'm looking right at her heart. Is she repentant? Does she desire forgiveness? Is she willing to rise and sin no more? I see past it all. That's exactly what he did. He took it right past all that and he went to the real issue. And that's what he does in your life. That's what he does in my life. He goes right to the heart of the matter. And even in silence, sometimes he roars, Oh God, do this for me. Oh God, I need this. And you hear nothing. Because you're praying the wrong prayer. Your focus is in the wrong area. God... God can be as simple as saying, but I asked you to do this. But I told you to do that. Why am I going to listen to this prayer and all these petitions and all these needs when you're not even faithful in this little thing over here? Let's backtrack and get to the heart of the matter and then we can get to those other things. That was the heart of God in this situation. Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover among an obedient ear. And I was like, God, what in the round world does that mean? Words fitly spoken like apples of gold and pictures of silver. You know, this is old school terminology. This is words and verbiage and adjectives and superlatives and examples they used way back then. Made sense. But when I read it, you know what it says? It says that words fitly spoken are costly. They're expensive. They're beautiful. They're always a pleasure to see and a pleasure to look at. They're well received. They're rich. When you have a word that's fitly spoken and goes right to the heart of the matter, it's costly. It's worth a lot. It's expensive. When you can see past the outward and speak right to the heart of the matter in one sentence or one word, and it gets right to the root. That's godly wisdom. Solomon may have wrote and penned Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but God wrote it. 
God wrote it. One reason I believe. Read this. Go to, go to 8 and then go to verse 9. In 8, 9, look at what it says. It says, Then those who heard it, being convicted in their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now this is a reason I really believe he was praying for them. They were convicted in their conscience. These were some hard-hearted men, deceived. A deceived person doesn't know they're deceived. And they're hard, and they're obstinate. You look at the Apostle Paul and read about him. He killed and persecuted the church, fully believing he was doing it with zeal for God. Right. Destroy these Christians. Throw them in prison. Zeal for God. And he had to get knocked off a, a white horse. Yeah. And these people, when they're convicted in their conscience, to me that speaks of God praying for them. He broke down those barriers, praying for them. That there would be a time when they would say, you know what, this is right. What we're doing is wrong. And I was remembering the scripture that some of these don't come out, but you have by prayer and fasting. Amen. Some of these things don't come out unless your prayer, there's prayer and fasting. And these hard-hearted men, ready to kill someone in front of everyone, convicted in their conscience and begin to leave. That is the most powerful part of the whole story. Anger, vengeance, murder, mad. You felt that way. Ready to lash out. And all of a sudden something breaks in the heart and something gets cut and the light turns on and they're broken inside and they're cut to the conscience. And the eldest to the last, the ones with the most stockpiled failures and sins all around to the last begin to walk away. Wherefore he is able to save them to the utmost that come to him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them in Hebrews chapter 7. For such a high priest came to us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens ever liveth to make intercession. When Jesus lifted himself up, he looks at the woman, he says, where are those thine accusers? Has no one condemned thee? And she rises and says, no one, Lord. And he looks her right in the eye and he says, neither do I condemn you. Rise, sin no more. You know, that's God's mercy. It's His grace. And this is a concept that when I was a young Christian, and I was just starting to read the Word and study, I, I always kind of in the back of my mind, just a little bit in the back of my mind, was like, God, aren't you a little soft on sin? Aren't you a little easy on her? It was just rise and sin no more. That's it? No penitence. Where's her rosary, you know? How many times does she have to pay for this sin? You know, what, what does she have to do to, to pay for this? And, you know, it's, it's so simple. And I was always in the back of my mind. I wasn't accusing God, but it was just, man, that was easy. And this is what I feel like the Lord showed me last night. If you think... I am soft on sin. Feel how hard the cross was. If you think I'm soft on her sin, come watch me die on the cross and see how violently God hated sin. That's so powerful. It, he took all that and it was just rise and sin no more because in a little while, I'm going to take it all on me. And they're going to beat me. And they're going to rip my beard out. And I'm going to bleed. And they're going to rip all the hide and all the muscle off my back. And they're going to drive nails through my wrists and nails through my ankles. And I'm going to scream out in pain. 
and say, God, have you forsaken me? You think I'm soft on sin now? <laughs> no, Lord. No. Look at my son. If you think I was easy on her, look at how hard I was on my son. Look at what I allowed to happen to him because of how vile sin is and how much I hate it. And the only price that could be paid. The sermon title was uh, a Silence That Roars. And he did it for her. He did it for those men that were there. He did it for all those that were watching. He did it for everyone that was in the city. He did it for everyone in the country. He died for everyone in the world. He died for everybody that used to live in the world. He'll die, he died for everybody that's going to live in the world. And he went silent like a sheep before his shearers. He made not a sound and he died in silence for them. And I prayed and God, what's the real application for our life? What are you really, really trying to show us in this? And there's many, many truths and there's many concepts in this account that apply to us and one, you have to be close to the source. Jesus was there praying. You have to be close to the source of power, the source of all wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He was there. God on earth was communing with the Father. How much more should we be in communion and prayer and focus to navigate the slippery paths of life? The situations that come across. It's not going to be a woman caught in adultery put at your feet. But there will be a lot of situations and hard things to navigate. And you say, if I say this, it will be wrong. If I say that, it will be wrong. God, what do I do? But in that silence, there should be a communion. In that place. And God begins to expose some of our hearts through that, through that account. Some of us that are austere in our judgment or judgmental and it's the same blood and it was the prayer that he was in communion and that he answered not a word and there's been many times in your life and many times in my life where maybe we should have or we did answer not a word that's one thing that God has shown me over the years much more often maybe we should ju just say nothing just don't say anything. Don't say anything. If you haven't had time to pray, don't say anything until you have had time to go pray. Amen. And get the mind of God and be at peace and calm down. And mercy. One of the things that God impressed on my heart so much when I was studying this is that the people of God, we have to be a people of mercy. A people of compassion. A people that look past what's on the exterior and say, there's been a lot of blood poured over my head to get through this life. Amen. How much more should I be able to extend that kind of mercy and patience for somebody else? Yeah. We love to totem pole sins. We love to point at what's in other people's eyes. Love it. It makes you feel good about yourself. It makes you feel superior. It makes you feel better. You feel more holy. If I can look at this person that does something on the outward, and that's the hard word. But the soft word is that he said, rise, sin no more. Amen. My blood covers you. And that cross, I died for you. It wasn't rise, have a good day. Amen. It was rise, sin no more. For those that sin no more, truly in your heart, you determine in your heart, I will not walk in this. I will not live this way. I won't have these attitudes. I won't say those things. God, I have to walk with you. You have to know you'd have victory over these things. His blood will continue to cover you. Amen. And it will change you. He will change you. He will change you. There is a grand canyon of difference between walking in sin and struggling against it. Amen. Those are two different things, people. Different. Sometimes you feel dirty when you struggle against sin, but you don't stop struggling. You don't stop fighting against you. You stop battling. Amen. You don't stop claiming the blood. Wash me as I walk through this because I know the victor is my victory. 
And I know he's right by my side. That's why he said that to her. Rise, sin no more. Walk in what's covered you. Walk in my worst mercy. Walk in the blood that I'm going to shed. And don't do it anymore, but live in that. Choose this day who you'll serve. There's mercy for you. There's mercy for me.